Hello, everyone. I'm so grateful to have all of you with us here today on a Friday afternoon, no less. I'm Ivy Love. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm a senior policy analyst in the Center on Education and Labor at New America. And we are here today to talk about community college bachelor's degrees, or as we call them, CCB degrees. Uh, we have a wonderful group of folks here today to share with you the what, why, where, and how of these programs. Um, so I just want to point out a few things before we get started. First, if you click the resources button on your event viewer, you'll find some links to some useful publications that'll add to what you hear today. Um, first, Maria Claudia Soler's brief documenting the growth of CCB state policy over time, a national inventory of all CCB states, colleges, and programs that exist nationwide from Deborah Bragg, Tim Harmon, and myself. And then finally, a brief from Elizabeth Meza and myself, uh, just published yesterday, looking at CCB colleges, programs, and student outcomes in Florida and Washington. So take a peek at those at your leisure. And then I just wanna reiterate what you heard. We have time built in to answer your questions today. So please do not be shy. There are no silly questions. Please feel very free to share those with us. And with that, I'm just gonna get going through our presentation. So let me pull up my slides for you. So first, what is a community college bachelor's degree? Well, these programs are distinct from transfer agreements with universities or even universities having a center on a community college campus. This is actually community colleges themselves conferring bachelor's degrees. So why would a state want to do this? Well, this list is certainly not exhaustive, but what I want to start off with you today is just sharing a few common reasons why states might want to authorize their community colleges to offer bachelor's degrees. One is that in some fields, some really critical fields, requirements to enter the profession or to progress in the profession are rising. I'm thinking of allied health immediately. Um, while nurses and respiratory therapists, for example, can enter the profession with an associate degree and successfully practice, more and more employers are wanting the extra education and skill set that comes with a bachelor's degree to either further support their professional practice or to facilitate the opportunity for those folks to move into leadership roles. So that's one common reason. States may also be interested in removing more barriers to bachelor's programs through these community college bachelor's opportunities. The states who are asking who's not showing up, who's not enrolling in existing bachelor's programs in our states might observe that they're perhaps not reaching older students or racially minoritized students or other groups that are being underserved the way those states want those folks to have access to bachelor's degree programs. Um, we do know that some groups of students who have been long underserved in higher education enroll in community colleges at higher rates, especially racially minoritized students and older students. So supporting the continuation to a bachelor's degree for those folks might be facilitated by these community college baccalaureate programs. Um, finally, and this rationale ties in with the second point, states that have set goals for themselves around bachelor's degree attainment may be inclined to think about CCBs as a means of meeting that goal. If other programs aren't working for folks that they want to reach with bachelor's program opportunities, perhaps expanding to community colleges could really help move the needle. Um, so those are some states rationales that that why they might want to expand uh, bachelor's opportunities to community colleges. Let's talk about why colleges might want to offer these programs. So first and foremost, these programs are about meeting local needs. Almost all authorizing states require proposed CCB programs to connect to labor market demand. So while the college may already have experience at the associate level in a particular field, if local employers are wanting bachelor's degrees, it makes good sense for the college to build on the expertise they've already built, to build on the program they already have in place to get up to that bachelor's level. We see that in many technical fields, which you're gonna hear more about later. The flip side of that is that perhaps another local public institution um, doesn't ha has a bachelor's program that's connected to a local need, but they might not have the capacity to support all the students needed to meet that local need. Um, together with the community college, if they're both able to offer bachelor's programs, they can connect more people to local jobs that are important and good jobs in their home communities. And related, one thing you'll hear more about later is that the average age of community college bachelor students in Florida and Washington, two states with the highest number of programs, run in the early 30s. These are not folks straight out of high school. 
And in that chapter of life, they may already be really deeply rooted in their own community. This is home. So for occupations where it's really important not just to bring folks with important skills to fill local needs, but to keep folks in the community, it makes good sense to bring the bachelor's degree opportunity to them where they live and where they are rooted. So that can be especially a strong rationale um, for teaching and allied health professions, among many others. So finally, before I hand the mic over, I want to show you what students and graduates of CCB programs are saying about why they chose this path to get a bachelor's degree. All of these quotations are from either New America interviews with students over the past few years in Florida, or from the work of Deborah Bragg and Elizabeth Meza, um, connecting with folks in Washington Community College Baccalaureate programs. So let's look at this first theme, relationships. So not all CCB students are going to attend the same institution for their bachelor's degree that they do for their associate degree or gen eds. But for those that do, we're hearing that they're really interested in staying close to their support systems. If they already have good relationships with faculty, advisors, peers, and others at their community college, it makes perfect sense that they would rather stay there to pursue a bachelor's degree. And then we can look at institutional fit. So a theme that has come up in a is a sense that culturally community colleges may feel like a better fit for students who are older, working full time, or are different from a student coming straight from high school in other ways. Fit isn't about prestige here. It is not about the college's brand name. It is about a sense of belonging. That's what we've heard from students. And finally, there's this practical sense of fit. So course schedules, support services, and other parts of institutions are just not always accessible for an older student who is working full time or as a parent or a caregiver in some other sense. In just a logistical sense, a program that's developed and offered through a community college that gets these many roles that they have in their lives may be the only bachelor's option that works well for them. For some students who were interviewed, it was a CCB or nothing. That's it, there, was no, there would be no bachelor's degree if it were not for this path to get a bachelor's degree. Um, so I'll just leave you with that. And I wanna thank you for coming and thank you for your attention. So now I'm gonna hand the mic over to Maria Claudia Soler, who's going to share with you what the state policy landscape looks like. Um, Maria Claudia, the mic is all yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Heidi, for the introduction. It is a pleasure to attend this virtual event to speak about state policy adoption of community college baccalaureate degrees. Before I start, I'll tell you briefly about me. I currently work as a research analyst at the American Council on Education, and my work focuses on domestic and international issues around access and success. While I work at ACE, the research that I'm gonna be presenting today is work that I did in a consulting role outside my ACE job. So I started researching CCB degrees working with Deb Rack, from, who you will, from whom you will hear later today, when I was doing my PhD at the University of Illinois. And later on, working as a consultant uh, for the community college research initiatives at the University of Washington. The first part of my presentation today, you can go, I, I uh, draws from a data note that I wrote in 2019 with three objectives, objectives in mind. The first goal was to update um, the national landscape of CCB degrees. I wanted to answer the question, where are these degrees being authorized? The second goal was to capture some trends in CCB state policy uh, adoption. Is this new? How is the growth of CCB degrees at the, at the state level happening? Third, I was particularly interested in describing some of the factors influencing state CCB policy adoption. To conduct this work, I relied on iPads, websites of coordinating boards in each CCB state, including the websites of state legislatures, state administrative agencies and institutions, as well as research literature and media. I will say here that updating the count of CCB states is particularly challenging, especially among states in which authorization takes place at the institution level. So every single effort to collect data on CCB conferring states, institutions, and programs, including New America's effort to do the same, is really, really relevant and appreciated. I will share now a summary of my findings. Regarding the count of CCB states and the national landscape, back in 2019, I reported 23 states that authorized at least one public two-year predominant degree-granting institution to confer baccalaureate degrees. Some updates have been made to this list, and today I will report 25. 
to include Massachusetts and Arizona. In Massachusetts, only one institution, Quincy College, confers CCB degrees. Arizona, on the other hand, is part of a whole new development that I did not capture, capture in my data note because CCB degrees were authorized last year in Arizona. What you see here in the slide is uh, CCB states in green and the full list of CCB states at the right hand side. So my question for everyone here is, and feel free, please, you have a, we have a poll for everyone prepared. Um, do you live in a state that authorizes CCB degrees? Okay. I don't think I can see the results to this uh, poll, but I trust Ivy will collect the information later and share with us. I will indeed, yes. Um, so one thing that I find fascinating about being able to go back one second, about being able to picture CCB states in a map like the one that you see in the screen is that it gives us an opportunity to think about accessible pathways to the baccalaureate, as Ivy was mentioning earlier, and about bachelor's degree attainment from the lenses of geography and equity. And that's pretty cool. Second, something else that I look at in my data notes relates to the state policy adoption of CCBs over time. I concluded that the growth in state adoption of these policies has been happening at a steady pace for the last two decades. So they are not really new. This figure shows that the number of CCB states has increased relatively smoothly between 1981 and 2021 at an average pace of 0.74 states adopting per year. Some of the factors influencing state CCB policy adoption include, first of all, an interest in improving associate to baccalaureate degree transfer policies and processes. Second, attempts to increase college completion rates. And third, efforts to align higher education with the changing labor market. Finally, I was really interested in describing trends in state policy adoption. So I classified states in two categories. Those in which all two year degree granting institutions are authorized to confer baccalaureate degrees, which I called type A, and those where authorization is granted on a case-by-case -case basis, type B. The current figure reflects such distinction. I won't go, I won't go, over, uh, won't, won't go, won't go over some of the details and patterns in this presentation, those which are included in the data note. As for now, I just, do, I just want you to focus on two specific things. First of all, you can go next, uh, Ivy. A statewide authorization rather than an institution or degree program specific one is especially effective at increasing the number of community and technical colleges that offer a baccalaureate degree. Washington and Florida are states uh, with statewide authorization, and both states exemplify this point. In Washington, 85% of the community colleges and technical colleges offer for CCB degrees. In Florida, such figure is 96%. Moreover, states' decisions to authorize CCB degrees in specific fields of study reflect labor market trends and efforts to avoid program duplication for the most part. For instance, Michigan authorizes all community colleges to confer CCB degrees but the degrees can only be offered on a couple of, of specific fields with workforce gaps, such as energy production, concrete technology, maritime technology, and culinary arts. In California, where only 15 community colleges are authorized uh, to offer bachelor's degrees, programs are specific to health information management, biomanufacturing, industrial automation, and a couple of other degrees, I mean, back in the, in the pilot phase. Most conversations about authorizing CCB degrees are really at the core of policies that emphasize the role that these degrees can play to improve college degree completion roles, to potentially address access and equity, um, and how this has to do with higher education, and fill workforce gaps that impact economic development. All these issues are pretty important to efforts to investigate details at the program level, like Tim Harmon has done, and to learn more about the outcomes of students' CCB programs, like Deb and, and Elizabeth uh, 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 as I will tell us later, are really needed. And that's precisely the information that we are gonna learn more about later today. So I'll stop here, but if you wanna learn more about CCB degrees in the US, you wanna take a look at the data note that I wrote, 
please access it. Uh, the link is going to be one of the slides, then the next slide, Ivy. And uh, feel free to contact me at mcsolarisnet.edu. You can go to the last slide. Yeah. That's all the information here. Thank you so much. Yeah. And uh, Tim. Thank you so much, Maria Claudia. Um, so to access this data note, you've got the first page here. There's a resources button on the event viewer that you can see. If you click that, you'll be able to access her a link to her data note, as well as a couple of other publications that'll kind of uh, give you a deeper knowledge of what you're going to hear today. So thank you so much, Maria Claudia. That was really wonderful. Oh, um, and keep in mind that in this data note, I emphasize this part a lot. I count the 23 states, but New Americans, for instance, New America's effort, for instance, has updated two more states that have been the outcome of new development. So if you see 25 or 23, again, disclaimer, I counted 23 back in 2019, but a lot has gone on since then. Yes, well, as you point out, we're authorizing like about one state per year. So it makes sense that, you know, two year, two to three years later, we have two more states. We're on a roll. Um, thank you so much again. I really appreciate it. So now I'm going to hand the mic over to Tim Harmon to talk about what's going on with CCB programs. Tim, it's all yours. Thanks, Ivy. And thanks, Maria, for that excellent setup to this whole discussion about the trajectory of how this has uh, evolved over time. It's fascinating to me to see how it's kind of been steady progress with a few periods of rapid growth, if you will. And it's definitely one thing you'll learn if you spend any time working on this at all is that this is definitely a moving target. So every time we turn around, something new is happening. So uh, we're going to spend a little time today talking about the inventory work that we've done and giving you some sense of the, what we're learning from that. Uh, but you should understand that uh, if you looked at it today, you would see a little bit different uh, array of programs and there's new programs coming online all the time and maybe some programs being retired. So it's a shifting thing. But when we do an inventory, we sort of take a point in time and, and that's, what we, that's what we're gonna be talking about today. An example of that, how the landscape is changing is California, which has authorized recently through legislation, all of its community colleges to offer the, the baccalaureate uh, degree, which is a huge change for them because they were in a sort of pilot status with 15 colleges uh, authorized to do that. They've, they've rationed it to 30 new programs a year, but that's a lot of programs and there's a lot of community colleges in California. So uh, that's just one example of how this landscape is changing. By the time we get done with this webinar today, it'll probably be different than what it is right now. So it's it's uh, it's an exciting time to be involved in this work. So uh, this first, uh, so let me just say a, a little bit about the inventory that we that we have been working on, <clears throat> and we're we're very pleased with what we've done so far. But we know we have a lot more work to do. Um, so we had a lot of information about what states were uh, authorizing the baccalaureate for community colleges and why and sort of the circumstances of that. But what we didn't know was which, which specific schools are, are doing this and what programs of study are they offering? And so we spent a, a, a good amount of time over last year uh, uh, digging into that. And so we really, we can, we, first of all, we had to say, well, who, who, what kind of institutions are we looking at? So we, we, we're looking at, those institutions that are associate dominant or baccalaureate mixed mission institutions. So that's kind of technical stuff, but these are, these are the schools that are primarily associate degree schools, community colleges, or their, their so-called mixed mission schools. These are, these are IPEDS categories 14 and 23 if you're keeping score. So we had to kind of draw a line around what we're looking at. And that's the, that's the, that's the population of schools that we're, that we, uh, queried here. And so this back between, it was April to October of last year is when the lion's share of this information was collected. And um, so we gathered information on authorized programs of study from state agency public records, websites, telephone interviews, et cetera. And then we drilled down into that to look at individual schools, went out and looked at school uh, individual college websites and even college program of study websites to gather information about the programs that they were offering so that we could characterize them in terms of the CIP codes that they were using, the type of degree that was being conferred, 
uh, the specific you know occupational area that they were that the program was meant to prepare students for and a number of other things but uh, sort of when when the program started because we wanted to have a sense of how long these programs had been in existence so that's just you know a little bit of background on the on the inventory work uh, and it continues so uh, the, what you're looking at here is a uh, sort of a, a diagram that kind of is meant to show the numbers of programs in each state. So the, the circles there are centered on the capital of each of the states that are authorized to provide, uh, have authorized the community colleges to provide a baccalaureate a degree, approximately 600 programs of study uh, spread across those states. Obviously, when you look at that, um, the majority of programs, just a little over 50%, 52%, in fact, of all programs of study are in two states, Florida and Washington. And when we expand that out a little bit, you add the three more states, Georgia, Texas, and Nevada, you're gonna get 75% um, of all the, um, of all the uh, CCB programs of study uh, that are in place. But as I mentioned, uh, we expect this map is gonna look a lot different a year or two from now when we come back uh, and do this again, because we have uh, just in counting up institutions, I think we have about 150, 145 institutions that are offering a community college baccalaureate right now. That's probably different today than it was yesterday, but in any case, it's moving target. But we, uh, one of the things we've identified that I think is interesting is that there are 200 uh, community colleges that live in states in which states have authorized their community colleges to offer the baccalaureate that have not yet fielded a program of study. So uh, there's a lot of room for growth and, we, and a lot of that is in California, but we expect a pretty significant amount of growth of this over the next, um, over the next few years. Next slide. So uh, we asked uh, the colleges or in our inventory, we found out um, what fields of study, what program categories uh, are these um, programs offered in. And we looked at that both in terms of the two digit and the six digit classification of instructional program codes. Uh, and so what you see here are the most common areas of, of study. And um, it, it was interesting to me that uh, business, like if a single most frequent category was business. And a lot of these are very applied programs in, in business management, logistics management, and, and a range of things that are very specific application-oriented uh, management uh, baccalaureates in the business area. Um, if you, we've broken out in this slide, uh, nursing as separate from the rest of health professions and nursing here, the 65 programs, these are, I think, almost exclusively gonna be bachelors of science and nursing programs. But it, uh, if you combine, all, if you take all health together, nursing and other and the other health professions, that's the single most, uh, you know, prolific area of uh, program development, and that's of course reflective of both the kind of credential um, evolution that's occurring in the health field, particularly in nursing, as was mentioned earlier, as well as just demand. You know, there we have a very deep demand for healthcare, and so we're colleges are responding to that demand. Uh, in a way that's uh, effective for reaching students that otherwise can't be reached or can't get access to these programs. Um, so you'll see those are sort of the major categories. And aside from you know business and healthcare, education is probably these are your next biggest one, and then computer information sciences and information technology generally. So large numbers of programs in each of those categories as well. And we'll talk a little bit about technology in, in a couple slides in. Um, the other one other question we asked was, um, what kind of degree is it? Um, and the most uh, dominant degree is the Bachelor of Applied Science. So it's a bachelor's degree with a with a occupational focus and applied focus. And so that makes sense because these in most states um, are require that these programs be developed in response to particular labor market requirements uh, and to meet unmet needs. And also many states further require that the programs not be directly duplicative of 
um, programs at the four-year layer. And so that uh, leads us to what you see here where the vast majority of programs are bachelors of applied science that are focused on specific occupational preparation. But a bachelor of science is second most common um, type of degree. Uh, and then the BSN, uh, Bachelor of Science in Nursing, which is a sort of a species of Bachelor of Science, but it's one that's focused specifically on nursing, is the third most frequent category of types of degree. And if you take those three types of degrees, the top three, they account for about 90% of all the different types of, uh, of the programs that are out there. So there are other types of programs. There are some Bachelor of Applied Technology, and then there's even some Bachelor of Arts, but the primary the primary focus here are on these applied programs of study. Um, and, uh, and that's true across all the different categories, you know, business and technology, et cetera. Next slide. Oh, so we also uh, drilled in a little bit on common tech programs. And here, I think we're looking at, um, mostly we're looking at uh, CIP codes um, 10 and 11, which would be 11 is computer information sciences and support services and then communication technologies is, is, co is CIP code 10, those two digit codes. And there's also some other programs in here from, from uh, like in health information management. That's a technically oriented program. It's is really a sort of an IT program, but it sits in the healthcare field, which is category 51 in the health professions. Also, there are some very applied business IT management type programs that exist in the business category. Um, and so that which is CIP code 52, two digit code there. So um, these, this is about 60-ish uh, programs, 70 programs. Um, if we bend the definition of tech a little bit and add in uh, some other programs like, um, like engineering or engineering technology or mathematics and statistics, and we would we would see more programs. Maybe all together we might have a hundred of our six hundred programs would be it was what you might consider to be like you know tech tech programs. Uh, so what's that? Maybe eighteen percent of our total program category is in the is in the very technically oriented fields. Okay. Um, I think that's, that's uh, those are my slides, and um, I'd like to turn it over to Deb Bragg now, who's going to talk about the results, outcomes, and what these programs mean for students. Thank you, Tim. Were we going to do another poll at this time? Um, yeah, I think we can. Thanks for the reminder, Deb. So we have another poll for you. If you haven't already answered the one about whether you saw your state illuminated on the CCB map, please go ahead and do that. It's still open. We're also curious what your role is. Um, are you a researcher, employer? Are you government staff, student? Um, we have another poll for you. We're just curious sort of what angle you're coming from to this conversation today. So if you have a second, please click the poll link and, and share that with us. We'd be really delighted. Thank you, Ivy. While folks do that, I want to just give a, a shout out and thanks to this panel, especially Ivy for helping organize and uh, uh, put our slides together. But I also want to recognize folks who we couldn't be presenting if they weren't uh, part of our research team. So I, I want to uh, thank Iris Palmer and Mary Alice McCarthy at New America. And you've mentioned uh, Elizabeth Meza, who is at the University of Washington and uh, a great partner in a lot of this work. There are several other people though, um, Tammy Napientech, uh, Ellen Wasserman, Stephanie O'Leary and Carrie Bishop. And I'm sure uh, the interns who are at, the, at New America, it really uh, is one of those, it took a village uh, to get to where, where we are today. So just a quick shout out to thank everyone. I'm gonna dive into what we've learned about students, student enrollment, student demographics and outcomes in the two states you've heard quite a bit about in uh, Florida and Washington. Um, because these are the states that not only, as you would imagine, have the most programs, they have the most students and um, a very particularly large number of students in Florida, 
which is um, our, you know, one of our first uh, states to start this and has now scaled to 100%. Uh, all of the colleges in Florida now are authorized to confer. They're not all doing it, but they are um, all there. This, um, this just gives you a sense of the students who are enrolled by demographics in those two states. Um, the, the, uh, this profile very much uh, matches the students who enroll in community colleges in those two states, which uh, isn't too surprising, but I do think it's important for us to note um, that 46% uh, of the Florida students are uh, students of color and 44% of the students, and these are students that have graduated from these baccalaureate programs in the community college. So quite a diverse group. So we can go to the next slide. Um, one of the things we've been able to do um, in Florida and Washington is to look a little bit at the wages of these graduates um, according to, to the, the programs that Tim was just talking with you about. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of things you can see in this slide. I'm, I'm going to go uh, relatively quickly, but for our conversation today, I'd encourage you to look at the top row um, and really compare the wages of men and women in Florida in computer and information sciences. Um, and also though that those, um, those numbers, those wages for Washington uh, women and men. And while we do tend to see a gap uh, between the salaries of men and women with women lagging behind in, in many of the fields where we've done this analysis, this is one of those areas where we see, I think, a really interesting finding uh, for, for women who have graduated from computer and information sciences uh, programs in Washington. And this is a strong rationale, by the way, for the state of Washington that has just adopted a statewide uh, a legislation allowing computer science programs to be awarded with Bachelor of Science degrees uh, to potentially, eventually, maybe every community and technical college in Washington. The strong recommendation for the adoption of these programs was that they were needed to address access and equity issues for women and students of color. So some promising results there. Um, Ivy, we can, uh, yeah, this is the next slide. This is um, somewhat similar. One thing I wanna point out in this slide is the, I, I think an important finding for Hispanic and Latinx students in health professions. If you look at that second band and you compare, um, again, fourth quarter wages for um, students by race, ethnicity, we see some pretty promising uh, results there in Florida, um, actually quite substantially higher than uh, black and white, which is you know, still problematic that uh, in that case, the black students wages are, are substantially lower I think then no, we hope they would be, but we do see something going on there um, with the Hispanic and Latinx students in, uh, who are completing these two programs in those two states. This is really early. I just want to emphasize, um, you know, some of these are not large numbers yet, um, but we are continuing to track and look at what is happening. And the number of graduates, just like the number of programs is growing. And so we'll be able to do, I think, some better analysis as we move forward. So we can go to the next slide. We wanted to just show you the, uh, what we have seen. And this is um, Ivy, uh, her, her good work, I think, looking at the Florida IT CCB graduates. So these are community college baccalaureate graduates. And just give you a sense of the demographics of that group. Um, you can see here 33% of those graduates, IT graduates, are part of the Latinx group. Almost 20% are Black. So we have, um, we have quite a diverse group there. Next slide. And this is a comparison of 
the wages of those students, graduate wages by race, ethnicity, and it compares what those students' wages would be when they completed the associate degree to what they receive in a bachelor's with a bachelor's degree in the similar program of study. So these are, um, you know, good good comparisons, um, and we can see almost or around a $13,000 wage bump for the students who have the bachelor's degree. So there is, a, there is quite a substantial um, increase. And when you think about the relatively low tuition and fee structure for community college baccalaureate programs, um, I think as Ivy pointed out in a conversation not too long ago, this appears to be a really good investment for students. So the next slide is really showing you the same thing with just emphasizing the difference there in that aqua um, band. So you can really see a difference in those wages of the associate and baccalaureate students. This is really promising and work that we, we know we need to do in other states and really amass the data so we can speak to this. Um, I'm gonna shift gears then and just the last few comments. Um, we've been able to do research in Washington that compares our community college baccalaureate students um, to university students in, again, similar program areas. And this is the first work that's really been able, that we've really been able to do these kind of comparisons um, of baccalaureate grads. This slide looks at the completion rates of students who are in that upper division uh, program of study to get their baccalaureate in a community college to the students who have, have transferred to a university and completing, and those completing their bachelor's degree. So this is, looking at, at students primarily once they've completed that lower division, they transferred either uh, to a university or stayed in their community college. And what we see here are increasing completion rates for the community college baccalaureate students. Um, the first analysis just looked from the beginning, you know, over the last decade, you know, what did we see computing just a, an overall completion rate? Then we said, well, you know what? That's probably not altogether fair because um, a lot of those programs were brand new. And let's look at programs that are a little more mature and you know, more comparable probably to the very mature university programs that have been you know, probably around for a long time. So we do see a little bit higher uh, completion rate. These are uh, quite high completion rates for um, you know, transfer students and baccalaureate students. So um, we will again continue to uh, monitor this, but a criticism uh, that you all may know of community colleges generally is that low completion rates. These are completion rates that are, you know, it, very high and, and very admirable uh, for just about any uh, college or university. So uh, something continue to watch, but at least very promising. We were also, we could not, we didn't have the data, unfortunately, to compare the demographics of the enough students anyway, in IT between the community colleges and universities. So we just wanted to show you nursing, which is another big program area, just to give you a sense of how those two groups compare. And this is fairly typical where we have enough numbers is we see uh, fewer white, a lower uh, percentage of white students in the distribution um, with a higher percentage of students of color. And those students tend to be distributed. And I also want um, to point out that we do see um, multiracial and indigenous students as well who are enrolled in these in these programs. So again, something we will continue to watch and, and because this, I, this notion of equity and access and completion is just uh, core, uh, we think, to these baccalaureate degrees. So I just have, um, I think, uh, oh yeah, our match. So we also looked and compared employment 
So an employment match means that using unemployment insurance wage records, we were able to identify students as employed. And we were able to do that in Washington for that CCB group of graduates and university graduates. We were able to look at the first quarter after completion, then the fourth and 12th quarter. What you can see here, the dark bar, are the community college baccalaureate students. So their employment match is higher than the university uh, gra you know, graduate match. Now, there's reasons for this. Um, we, we can't say, um, essentially, there's a lot here. One is that many times these older community college bach baccalaureate students are already employed. So they already have more of a history than the younger university uh, graduates. We also may find um, that these students do tend to stay in the state and in the area where the UI wage records will pick them up. Um, and university graduates may have more, uh, may be more likely to leave the state or, or to be in jobs where we don't catch them in that UI wage uh, analysis. But these again are really important to continue to find, uh, follow. And I just wanna point out for uh, the critics, of these degrees who, who often um, claim that the students won't be able to secure uh, the same kind of uh, good jobs uh, as university graduates. We just really don't see that uh, in the data. Now, when we dig deeper, maybe we will uh, be able to see some differences um, that we all need to know about, but um, we have not found them in this initial descriptive work. And then there, um, the one more slide. I want to point out for you the middle uh, computer and information sciences, where uh, we're com uh, we are comparing um, again the CCB graduates and the university graduates. And here is an area that may be of interest to you where uh, the CCB graduates earnings are exceeding the university graduates earnings um, in, the, in the two years or the two time periods we could compute, which was at one year um, within the one year of graduation and one year after graduation. So some really promising um, results here. Um, and, and also, if we had more time, we could, we could dig in and, and, and really talk about this a bit more. But it gives you a good sense, I think, um, of some of the promising results we're finding um, and also some of the research we'll, we still need to do to better understand what's really happening with these students and graduates. So I'm going to turn it back to you, um, Ivy, and thank you again for everything you do for our team. Well, thank you and thank you to all of you. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing um, because we are anxious to answer all of your questions. Um, while I'm pulling up the questions document, I was thinking about what we anticipate might be around the bend for CCBs. And so I will talk through that while I'm pulling things up, but I would just invite the other panelists to offer your thoughts as well. One thing that has come up a few times over the course of our conversation today is that um, a couple of states have expanded their authorization of community colleges. This is not just one piece of legislation and then the state is done. So as Tim mentioned, California has now authorized any of their community colleges to offer a bachelor's degree program. So one thing that we see around the bend is probably a lot more programs there over the coming years. Um, Texas is another state that comes to mind where I anticipate we'll see a lot more programs. And then there are states like Ohio who recently passed a second piece of legislation that is bringing the bachelor's program to nursing. They are specifically authorized to, to offer a bachelor of science in nursing that is a completion program. So nurses with an associate degree can do their final two years um, through this and earn that bachelor's degree. So I anticipate we'll see more of those. Um, are there other things that are coming to mind for you all, um, what you think might be around the bend um, for the community college baccalaureates? I, I will say just to add real quick, um, I think we might see some first authorizers or conversations about first authorization. I know there are other states that are curious about how this strategy may work for them. Um, so we're, I'm feeling optimistic. So we'd love to hear from all of you while I'm looking through these questions. 
I will open it up. Well, I'm excited to see what's going to happen in Arizona. Um, we just held our national conference there, as um, my colleagues know, and uh, besides a, a very large contingent from California, there were uh, many folks from Arizona who are, are very excited. And um, I saw a preliminary list of uh, uh, programs that the colleges are interested in working on, and it is quite a long and impressive list. So, I, you know, go Arizona. It'll be uh, mm -hmm. quite interesting to see what they do. Absolutely. Maria Claudia, did you want to add something as well? I want I saw someone asking about um, fee, um, fee structures and how common uh, it is to have different fee structures. Um, this is not something I covered in, in my data note, but when I was looking, when I first started to look at these degrees, I was really, really interested in, in the cost of these degrees and how we can look at the return on investment. And this has to do with, I mean, a point that Deb also covered when she was trying to compare, you know, like the, the earnings uh, for like CCB degrees versus baccalaureate, traditional baccalaureate degrees. And something that I found really, really puzzling is that it's the information, this is not just about CCB degrees, but the information for many, many institutions uh, is, is really hard sometimes to understand what's the total cost of a degree. So I remember myself trying to classify lower division courses and upper division courses and trying to come up with, okay, how much would be the total um, like of this degree? I remember calling institutions and asking them, okay, but can you please tell me how much does this degree cost? No, but we cannot tell you it's hard to come up with a number. It depends on how many courses you've taken. So I was just thinking for myself, I mean, I have a hard time sometimes understanding how much is the cost of this degree. And I was again, approaching these degrees as a researcher and doing the study on the websites and calling institutions. And I was trying to put myself in the shoes of a, of a student who uh, has finished high school or is starting to work or is ha hasn't had a lot of experience to college. And I was just thinking about how hard it is sometimes to come up to understand those types of things. So working on uh, making information accessible for students is really important. And I think that applies to to most institutions and programs. And there are some states in which the legislation clearly says, this degree is not gonna cost more than 10K. That's one approach. And some legislations have adopted that approach. In some other states, that's not the case. So again, to respond to that question about this person who asked how, how, how common it is to find different fee structures, my answer is, it's super common. That's probably the norm these days. So working on making information accessible to students is important. So we, we think about students as consumers who are informed and make informed decisions. That's something, for instance, uh, uh, that's an area of improvement, let's say. That was yeah. very diplomatic and, and very accurate. Yes, transparency for students is very central. Um, Tim, Deb, did either of you have any thoughts you wanted to share on tuition or fee structures? Based, on, we we got a question from an audience member about that. And can you say more? I I'm sure. not good understanding. Let me just read what... the whole question for you. Yeah. So curious how common it might be to have different fee structures for upper and lower division components mm -hmm. of students' programs. So we haven't talked about Washington yet, but I suppose we could. Kind of the Washington, yeah. Florida. Washington and Florida do this very differently between the two of them. Exactly. Um, well, it, it, it depends on uh, states. So states approach this differently. And some states that are highly decentralized could even approach it differently from institution to institution, which leads to the complexity that uh, Maria Claudia mentioned. Um, so Washington has a policy that says the um, tuition rate will equal at the upper division will equal the average regional public university uh, tuition rate. And the reason for that was that they're in negotiating the authorization of the degrees, there was the feeling that cost is a big issue and that they want a parity in, in those two. Other states have different taken a different tact. I, I believe in a state like Michigan, um, 
there is no difference. The upper and lower division tuition rate is uh, essentially the same. Now, the fees may vary at the, uh, and that is harder to figure out, as Maria Claudia said. Um, I, and IDI, the Arizona bill, I said, I think the tuition can exceed 150% of the lower uh, division tuition rate, I believe. Um, so anyway, it's, it's not standardized. It varies uh, across the country. There is a strong, I think, um, you know, sort of ethic principle that this tuition should be less than um, the four-year publics, but uh, who, who are seen as the peer uh, in awarding baccalaureate degrees. But we need more, we need to know more about that. And I believe our colleague, uh, Iris Palmer is working on this and will be writing a brief to really unpack this and help us understand it mm -hmm. um, and give some insight from a policy perspective. So we all look forward to her work. Yep, we're in the thick of it right now. So yes, we'll have more to share soon. Um, before I kind of bring the next question to the group, I just wanna quickly answer um, an easy question that came in, which was, does DC allow CCBs? No, the District of Columbia does not. And to go a step further, neither does Maryland, neither does Virginia. So there are no community colleges in the DC metro area where you could get a bachelor's degree. So thanks for sharing that question though, I appreciate it. Um, let's look at, oh, I've got a very good question for us. What happens to public four-year institutions when community colleges add bachelor's degrees? Does their enrollment drop or does this grow the pie? Um, I might give that to Deb, do you wanna take that one first? And then I'll open it up to, to the group. Sure. Um, we we recently wrote uh, a book chat chapter, Maria Claudia and Elizabeth Mesa and I on Washington, and we looked at enrollments at the two year and four year level over time. The trend over the time these have been offered, we've seen enrollment growth in both sectors. Um, it it pretty much parallels. Um, so it's it's not as though we see a big increase in baccalaureates. At the community college and a big drop in university, we see uh, we see the pretty much the same trend line over time, even during this whole time. So um, that's very descriptive results, but we did see that. And the only real study that we know um, has been done that's looked at this is uh, researchers at the University of Florida who analyzed um, potentially whether enrollment was impacted at the baccalaureate level in both um, public and private nonprofit and for-profit. And what they found was they did not find a, net, a drop in enrollment in the public institutions, but they did find a drop in enrollment at the uh, private for-profit uh, institutions. So it does look like there could be a shift and that shift could um, be that students stay at their community college to get that baccalaureate rather um, instead of uh, then getting a baccalaureate at a for-profit institution. Um, so that's an important finding. Mm -hmm. so, so it's maybe growing the public institution pie. Um, yes, yes. Say, yeah. I, I should also Potter. say okay. that um, uh, Mike Potter, who's uh, really a, a very knowledgeable, did his dissertation, uh, just let me know he is trying to replicate um, that study in Washington has got some interesting data. So uh, that is a study that we really would like to see done other places. That's great. Um, Tim, okay. Maria, Claudia, do you have any thoughts? And then I've got one more question I wanna make sure to get in for us. Well, we should gonna add, I was gonna add something quick uh, to that, um, to, to address that question. And is that when we ask about that question in general terms, we need to keep in mind, mind that when when we say like what type of state are we talking about is that the, all community college all community colleges are authorized to uh, offer the degree and then we look at all enrollments across the state or is it a state in which we need to focus on specific prog on, on specific institutions and moreover do we need to focus on specific degrees that are the ones for which an institution is authorized to offer the degree so all those types of details make answering that question like is a, is a challenging aspect because we need to look at different levels of analysis and many times that data happens 
to be unavailable. So uh, for the most part, what we see in some programs, as Deb was mentioning before, is that we see that enrollment has increased. We're still trying to figure out what, why. Um, but again, one needs to be really careful and focus on what institutions, what states, what specific programs, because legislation happens to be restrictive in many cases. And it could be that the community college offers, I don't know, 15 degrees, but only three out of those 15 are the ones who we can consider as CCB degrees. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was just my two cents. Yeah. Thank you. Tim, I, I saw you well, wanted to say something as well. I don't know if it's been, if it's been mentioned yet, you know, but this business of what happens needs to have the context of what's been happening with with the pandemic and the significant decline in overall community college enrollments and we i think we have some evidence to suggest that uh, those enrollment declines did not occur in the in those programs that were baccalaureate in the community college layer so that's indication i think that there's one significant demand for it we're reaching a population that we might not otherwise reach and that maybe traditional students uh, are deferring entry uh, into, um, into post-secondary instruction generally during the pandemic, it, but uh, maybe people that are already working and otherwise engaged uh, didn't because they, you know, they, had, they had means to access that. So it, it is a complex situation. You have to look at it in the, in the context of what's going on right now. I wouldn't worry about too much about it right in the last couple of years because it's all been thrown in a in a hat. Well, isn't that the truth? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I've got one more question for us. And I, in the last three minutes that we have, and I might be selfish and try to answer it first and then I'll open it up to all of you. But we have a question of, um, let me find it again here. What are the chief barriers community colleges face in getting their state to approve CCBs? And what are successful strategies for overcoming those barriers? That is a big old question and I cannot answer it in three minutes, but here's the short version that I can give you. Um, I think understandably, sometimes universities are nervous about this. Um, they're nervous that there's going to be duplication and that they're going to be going after the same students. So the study that Deb mentioned comparing, um, you know, the how this may have impacted state university enrollment versus for-profit enrollment um, is an important finding, I think, to share with universities. And also another thing where I have seen kind of light bulbs go off and talking to folks about this who may be a little on the fence is this notion that the average student in a CCB program in Washington is 32, the average in Florida is 31. You're not fighting for the same students. You're not fighting for the same students. And in the evidence that I have seen so far, sort of to Deb's point, is that the public institution pie is growing. And I think if that becomes clear to folks in the university sector that this is about what we can offer together and who we can reach together rather than going after the same students with public money, um, that that hopefully will allay some concerns. But I mean, I would say that, you know, I, I get the nervousness. I get the nervousness, but I think there are some reasons that we could allay that. Um, do others want to answer in about 30 seconds? <laughs> Um, I'll say quickly, so much more to say. And, um, one all concern about CCB degrees has to do with the, with mission creep. So there are many, many opinions around whether um, a community college that offers uh, a baccalaureate degree wants to be like a university and that in like some concerns are being raised about what's the what's the mission of a community college, what this has, what, what this has to do in terms of access and equity. And there are some people concerned about yeah. that particular aspect. That's um, a good point. It's also true that some community colleges did shift to become universities after offering the baccalaureate, the baccalaureate degree, but that's not the norm. Right. And for the most part, some legislations yeah. also include uh, like pieces saying that the community college needs to maintain that mission mm -hmm. and remain to be to remain. Uh, a community college. I'll stop now because I stole those 30 seconds. My no, you're fine. You're fine. Thank you all for coming. We're so grateful you're here. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. Maybe we can try to tweet out some responses later. Um, I wish you all a great afternoon, a great weekend, and thank you to all of the wonderful panelists who joined us. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks. Bye-bye.